Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. Today, we will also be taking voice questions. So if you prefer to ask your questions in person, uh, once the presentation is complete, I will introduce this option. So today's speaker is Helen Eaton. Helen is the linguistic consultant for the Uganda Tanzania branch of the SIL, as well as the branch linguistics coordinator, and she works with the Mbaya uh, cluster project. Her research interests include Sondawe, particularly grammar and discourse, Bantu languages, and orthography. Please join me in welcoming Helen as she gives her talk, Plurality and Pluractionality in Sondawe Verbs. Thank you very much. I think uh, for those of us who were at the April the 1st reading group meeting on Pluractional, some of what I'm going to present will sound familiar. Um, we looked then at Roland Kiesling's paper on verbal plurality in Sundawe from 2002. And uh, many of us also will have read about the idea of a plural stem as an aerial phenomenon in the Rift Valley contact zone, linking the West Rift languages of Southern Cushitic, namely Alagua, Burungay, Gorra and Iraq, with Southern Nilotic um, Datoga and Sandawi as put forward by Kiesling, Mouse and Nurse in their discussion of the area. Um, they also mentioned pluractionality, but um, as a feature of the contact zone languages, it's not such a good indicator for language contact as it is so common in Africa as a whole. Um, what I'd like to share with you today is some data on plurality and pluractionality in Sandawi verbs. This isn't a current area of research for me, and I'm not going to get into any particular theoretical approach or attempt a typological comparison, but you're welcome to do that afterwards during the comments and questions if you'd like. But I think the data in itself is worth our attention. So let's uh, start by looking at the use of suppletion for number marking in verb stems in Sandawi. In intransitive verbs like these, there is a singular stem and a plural stem with the number marking referring to the subject. So for example, we have meaning come when the subject is sing singular and uh, meaning come when the subject is plural. And uh, not all intransitive verbs have this distinction. So something like hey, meaning enter, for example, or hanga, leave, intransitive, uh, they have the same stem for singular and plural subject, but these are examples of those that have two stems. So if we look at an example of this in action, go tsano hango adi, then we left and came home. So we've got an example of both here. We've got one stem that doesn't change for number, hanga, and one which does, nati. And there's an indication of subject number on three of the four orthographic words here. So the narrative conjunction, go, is marked for the subject number. Um, it's first person plural. And the postpositional phrase has a first person plural, realis, pronominal, clitic, in agreement with the subject as well. And the second of the two verbs has a, a plural stem. So three quarters of the words have some indication that the subject is plural. In transitive verbs, uh, where there is a suppletive verb stem, which is not actually that common, um, it's determined by the number of the object. So instead, many stems would use object marking suffixes if number needs to be marked and there's no other change to the stem. We'll see examples of that later. As you can see from the table, there is a third option as well. There's an objectless uh, form. Transitive verbs in Sandawi, which occur without object marking, are used to convey imperfective aspect. And object marking, conversely, is an indicator of perfective aspect. So um, for these verbs, um, there's also an objectless form for use as an imperfective. And this form's either related to the plural stem form. So for gawa, the objectless form is very similar looking to ga, the plural object form or it could be uh, completely unrelated like ko or hedeka, um, which are the objectless forms of take and not related to ka, the plural object form. And an example of this in action. So then I take the flower and put it in. Si comes, si ea, ga, te. 
here it shows that it is actually possible to have a singular and a plural stem referring back to the same object referent in the same sentence. So the singular form of take, C, is used as the quantity of flour is taken as a whole. And then as it's gradually put into the water, um, it's treated as a plural object and the plural verb stem for put is used, ga, uh, plus an apl applicative because it's being put in something. So the context um, of this text suggests that the, the flower is treated as a plural object for this second verb because the amount is not put in as a single whole, it's put in gradually in smaller amounts. And the verb choice is the only indicator of this. Um, there are different approaches to defining plurectionality, but this would be seen in many approaches as an instance of plurectionality. The plurality is event internal, not event external. So the action of putting in the flower is repeated on this single occasion, not over several occasions. So it's iterative, it's not habitual, it's not frequentative. And it's the choice of the plural stem that gives us this plurectional interpretation. Um, the verb that has a, a singular stem, C, take, has um, a third person masculine singular object. And alongside the number marking by suppletion that we've just seen, Sandawi has a series of object agreement morphemes. So there are three sets. They all show person, number and gender. And for third person plural, they also show animacy. So we've got a, a basic set for a direct object and then also a benefactive series and also an applicative series. So the benefactive series includes the morpheme uh, before first and second person objects and gu before third person objects. And the applicatives are uh, analysed as including the applicative morpheme te um, for all persons, although it is actually reduced um, quite a lot in or assimilated in different ways for most of the persons. The uh, suppletive singular and plural stands for transitive verbs must have one of these object agreement morphemes otherwise the objectless form would be used as we saw in the previous slides. So here in example three we've got two examples of singular stems for take and throw and each has a first person singular object. So, take me and throw me into the sea. And maybe at this point, I should say something that for most languages would be taken as read, but uh, these object agreement uh, morphemes always suffix to the verb, not to another sentence constituent. There is flexibility in the position of the subject agreement clitics, like the second person plural imperative pronominal clitic here, que, and the first person singular realis pronominal clitic in the previous example, which was on the object. Um, but actually object morphemes in Sandawe behave um, in a more expected way, and they're only suffix to the verb. So before we uh, move on to look at more examples of object agreement, I'd just like to point out two morphemes in particular, um, coloured red now in this table. They're formally similar and easily confused in surface verb forms because of vowel length and tonal phenomena, but they are clearly distinct at the underlying level and they are functionally different. So we've got third person plural inanimate object agreement suffix wa, which has uh, a long vowel and high tone. And then contained with the third person plural, within the third person plural inanimate applicative, there's now a low toned wa um, with a short vowel, um, which I analyze as a pluractional morpheme, um, which we'll look at uh, more of shortly. The analysis of the applicative form is deriving from this pluractional morpheme plus a third person masculine singular object could lend support to the idea that the direct object morpheme wa with the long r is likewise made up of a pluractional plus a singular object. And this was a suggestion put to me by Ed Elderkin. And if that is the case, then there's been a complete uh, tonal reanalysis of the wah morpheme because it behaves tonally like a high tone morpheme rather than a combination of a low tone morpheme and high tone wah. 
going back to example three for a moment, the object morphemes here um, behave quite predictably. In general, the first person and second person object morphemes for both singular and plural act as expected when they're suffixed to different verb stems, whether it's two suppletive verb stems which differ for, for number like um, C or um, to stems which only have one form. But the third person singular and plural forms are much less predictable. So here are some of those um, grouped into uh, uh, smaller groups according to their morphophonological behavior. Um, tonally, everything is as expected. There's nothing unusual, but segmentally, there's a lot uh, going on in these forms. So the first group is the simplest because um, the suffixation of the object morphemes here follows predictable behaviors. So uh, for the singular forms, the vowel is lengthened, the final vowel is lengthened when you add the third person masculine singular object morpheme. And when the third person inanimate plural object morpheme is attached, there's no assimilation, um, just tonal issues going on, but nothing else. Uh, in the second group, the singular form is remains predictable, but the plural form is different. So wa becomes ma. And there's also sometimes some vowel changes you can see in bike becoming bikima and glomo becoming glomma. Almost all the verbs in this group follow a particular tone melody, the low high tone melody, which is interesting. And another point of interest is the second pronunciation given there for um, the, the plural object form of leave, bikima. And this actually comes from an older speaker, um, bikimewa instead of bikima, which um, suggests that there may be a me morphine uh, in this example and perhaps in the other examples which have a ma. Um, and this is a morpheme that's been analysed before um, by Dempforth as an iterative morpheme and we'll see some more examples of that one soon as well. And then we have a third group. Um, here the stems are all high high or low high and they all end in a high toned e vowel and they have a restricted um, set of consonants in the second a consonant position as well. And when the third person masculine singular object is suffixed to the stem, it's the first vowel and not the second, which is lengthened. So it's not time, it's time. And uh, when the plural object is suffixed, the second syllable of the stem is elided and a glottal stop precedes the object morpheme. So tiwa for the first of those. And uh, in those group, in those verbs in this group, which have the, the me as the second syllable, um, once again, we have something that may look like a separate morpheme, but this time it's in the singular form. And for those containing the me, perhaps this, we could argue this is the iterative suffix uh, lexicalized, because uh, if you look at the lexical aspect of these verbs like cooking and forging, there is an iterative um, property to the, the actions here. And finally, we have a fourth group which contains monosyllabic stems with a final rising or high-toned e vowel, which would exhibit no changes if the third person masculine singular object e were attached and normal morphophonological processes occurred. So instead, we have a change of vowel to a, and there's some variation in the suffixation of the plural morpheme. Um, sometimes a glottal stop is added like the previous group, but it's also possible to have um, uh, reduplication, as in the last one, hide them. And it's the R vowel, not the air vowel in all of those as well, which is interesting. So in the presentation of object marking so far, we've seen two morphemes that have turned up in some of the plural forms, the, the wa with a short low toned vowel and me. So I'd like to look at those in a bit more detail now, starting with wa. And a common function of this morpheme is to indicate a plural subject, as in for. So der wa e kawa, the whiskers are heavy. Uh, without this morpheme, the sentence would be grammatically complete, um, but it would mean the whisker is heavy. So the verb to be heavy is not one that shows suppletion for subject number. 
So it could be have a singular subject or a plural subject. And the pluractional morpheme is the only indicator of plurality here. And the sentence is realis, and so it's understood with a present or past time reference, depending on the context. But there are no realis pronominal clitics here, as they have to go on non-subject constituents, and the only available one is the verb, and that would, um, putting the clitic there, would give a polarity focus reading. Um, the whiskers are heavy, which would be undesirable in the discourse context. So instead you have a subject focus clitic on the subject MP, and this is only possible in realis sentences, so it in itself is also an indicator that it's realis. So the wa is doing the job of showing um, the subject number here. And I've glossed the morpheme as pluractional here because it, uh, it fits well with Newman's first definition of pluractionality, which I've given here. He said that he, he coined the term pluractional in order to set apart the semantically endowed verbal plural from the inflectional agreement stems. Although pluractional verbs sometimes relate to plurality of a nominal argument in the sentence, e.g. subject, direct object, even indirect object, the essential characteristic of such verbs is almost always plurality or multiplicity of the verb's action. So I think this fits well um, with what we have in Sandawe because um, there's a plurality or a multiplicity of the verb's action on this one occasion. It's not that one whisker is heavy on multiple habitual occasions, but that more than one whisker are heavy or is heavy on this single occasion. But as in example five, there are also occasions where the pluractional morpheme is used when a singular subject repeats an action. So here we've got um, then again, hyena went to Dick Dick's house and stood around and Momewa is, stood around, is understood as stand together with uh, another verb, go around, to, to stand around. And it makes it clear because of the pluractional morpheme that the standing around is repeated. It's not clear from the context of the story whether this is on one occasion or on multiple occasions. So the sentence initial conjunction is from the repetitive series. So it can be glossed then again. So it may be that the morpheme is appropriate here because the action is happening on multiple occasions or because the standing around is seen as a multiple action. So I think either a habitual or a durative uh, interpretation is possible here. But there are other examples where a habitual interpretation is clearer. So as in six. What work do you do? So there's no object marking on the verb, which indicates that the verb is imperfective. And um, knowing the context of the story, the question is asked by a participant in the story to another one who's not at that moment doing any work. So um, it's clear that it's a habitual situation that's meant. Uh, a different kind of imperfective aspect reading can be achieved by uh, conjoining the verb ie stay to the lexical verb and again you, using the pluractional as in seven. So hojok me na ying hikwa. Why do you keep going there? So um, here the understanding is more why do you continue to go there what, rather than why do you go there from time to time uh, because of the verb ie which is joined to the verb go. So although it literally says stay and go, it means keep going. So we've got slightly different interpretations here. Um, both examples are imperfective though. Both have singular subjects and both include uh, the plurational morpheme. And then example eight adds another morpheme, the durative yo. So here there's a plural narrative conjunction a ah, at the start of the clause and a plural stem verb ne. So already the first two words of this utterance have shown, um, each of them shows already that the subject is, is plural. So it's not necessary to have a plurational morpheme to indicate the number of the subject um, as it is, as we've seen in other examples, but instead um, it's together with the durative morpheme, it's indicating that the situation described by the verb endured for an exceptionally long time. Um, 
and the durative on its own doesn't necessarily mean that although it's labeled durative um, it commonly does mean durative but it can also just um, mean some kind of exclamatory have some kind of exclamatory force so i think that is why putting it together with the pluractional makes it clear that it is durative in this um, instance the positioning of this pluractional morpheme is uh, in relation to other morphemes can be quite crucial to the meaning so in nine, we've got an example, Ninkla Kongroazi, and he scrubbed himself well. So here we've got a singular subject who has to scrub himself repeatedly to get rid of the dyes on his skin. If the pluractional and reflexive morphemes, which occur in that order, are reversed, um, you would have a, a grammatical sentence, but the meaning would be, and they, referring to the dyes, scrub themselves well, congruatsiwa. Um, even though the inflectional marking is singular, there's an adverb here that's carrying the realis pronominal clitic for third person masculine singular. And this reversed order can be seen in a different example from a different text. So, makeon hinge chingsik iwa. As for some troubles, they have diminished. So there's a plural subject, some troubles, and um, they have diminished themselves. And it's interesting that the inflectional agreement here is also singular, despite there being a plural subject. And it's actually quite common for clauses with an inanimate plural subject to have singular subject um, inflectional marking, as long as there's some other indication in the clause that the subject is plural. So in this example, both the quantifier sum, which has actually got a plural morphing re in it, and the pluractional uh, marker on the verb make it clear that this subject is plural. And it's also possible for animate plural subjects, um, providing the subject is not marked with a plural person gender number morpheme to um, have singular agreement. So example 11, the children died. Um, this is an unusual noun um, in Sandawi because the noun itself has number marking. So Moko is um, already plural. And then it has a plural verb stem, klatte. So there is already, again, two indications of um, the plurality. And, in, and now the realis pronominal clitic at the end there um, can be and actually must be singular. But we can contrast this with 12, where there's a person gender number marker, so, uh, attached to the noun, or gong so, um, which is possible but not necessary in this example, and often occurs, this kind of marking often occurs when there is a, a specificity morpheme, as here, but needn't if the noun is already um, inherently plural. And now, instead of the um, singular pronominal clitic, we've got the plural one, which is very similar, um, but just has a glottal stop at the end, a, uh, instead of a. Uh. So let's come back now to the second morpheme, uh, which is less common in my texts. Um, it's me. And again, there's some kind of plural interpretation, it's clear. Um, we saw this in the transitive verbs with plural object marking earlier, um, part of an earlier tables repeated here. So the second pronunciation of the plural object form of bike, bike mawa, suggests that um, there is possibly a me morpheme here. And this was analyzed by uh, Dempfolf as an iterative suffix, which also conveys the meaning of intensiveness. And in some examples in my text corpus, it's very similar in meaning to the pluractional. So here in 13, ba, wa, de, tia, atia, akime, then many pigeons came and descended. So the grammatical subject here um, is singular, as you can see from the conjunction at the start is ba, which is singular rather than a, which would be plural. Um, but again, we've got um, a quantifier, which um, makes it clear that there's a plural subject. So we've got many. 
uh, and also the fact that we have a plural stem verb come happy makes it clear um, and the second of the two verbs is suffix with the iterative morpheme me so the plurality of the subject is clear without it so its function is not simply to to help us understand that it's a plural subject but perhaps this is an example of the kind of intensive meaning Dempfolf noticed and it's not absolutely clear from the context of this narrative but it seems likely that the iterative morphine is encouraging the interpretation that pigeon after pigeon was coming and descending rather than a single group of pigeons descended en masse. Um, as well as being used with a, a plural subject as here, we can also have an iterative suffix with a plural object. So the following are some interesting examples, elicited ones this time, which show that there are quite interesting uh, nuances of meaning possible. So in 14, Bora Kipeng Oronse. Um, a mouse has made a hole in a piece of clothing. So there's no plural marking of any kind on the verb. The verb stem itself is not marked for number. There are no number marking suffixes. The subject of the sentence is indicated by the subject focus clitic attached to the NP. And this has only one form. It doesn't differ according to whether the subject is singular or plural. Um, there's no number marking on either the subject or the object. So in the absence of any plural marking of any kind, it's understood as singular on all accounts. So a singular mouse has made a singular hole in a singular piece of clothing. And then in 15, the iterative suffix has been added directly after the verb and before the causative, and it's now pronounced oromse. So now we understand that the action of making a hole was uh, happened more than once was repeated within the event so the meaning is that several holes were made but still in one piece of clothing and then in 16 we have a second iterative uh, suffix this time after the causative and the singular object morpheme has been changed to a plural object morpheme so we now have horomsima and now we have multiple holes being made in multiple pieces of clothing and I think if the subject were plural as well and it had been mice causing the destruction and not a singular mouse then a pluractional morpheme moi would be ad added at the end of the verb for the plural subject unfortunately my data notebooks are not in the same country as me at the moment so I can't check that um, and I can't remember if I asked that because it was a long time ago now but um, what's interesting and what's clear is that the ordering of the two iterative morphemes is iconic. So the one closest to the verb modifies the verb itself from meaning the making of a single hole to the making of multiple holes. And then the second is further away and marks the plurality of the subject. And we have already seen this kind of ordering um, in examples nine and 10 with the pluractional where it's closer to the verb stem in nine and shows that the, the scrubbing, um, the action of the verb is multiplied and it's further away in 10 where the action of the verb is unchanged but it marks the argument as multiplied so this time the subject rather than the object but the same idea. So in summary um, we have seen that there are suppletive stems for subject in intransitive verbs, suppletive stems for object in transitive verbs, um, three series of object marking suffixes with quite a lot of variation, particularly in the third person singular and third person inanimate plural forms, a morpheme that's been uh, described as pluractional, and another one that's been described as iterative. And what I find particularly interesting um, is the overlapping functions between some of these devices, and particularly if we add in number marking on subject noun phrases and in pronominal clitics. So if we think about how uh, the number of a subject can be marked, there are several different strategies. So we could have number marking on the subject NP. We could have a singular or plural pronominal clitic or conjunction in the clause. For intransitive uh, verbs, we could have a singular or plural verb stem, and they, we could use the pluractional or the iterative or a combination of several of these methods. 
And interestingly, there can also be a conflict in, the, in number between the different strategies. So the pronominal clitic can be singular and the verb stem plural, for example. Um, and then it's understood to have a plural subject, but there are also some restrictions. So a subject MP marked as plural in a particular way can't occur with a singular pronominal clitic. And then for number marking of an object, we've got a similar, similar situation to the subject. So again, we have number marking being possible on the object NP. Um, we can also have singular or plural object marking in terms of agreement suffixes on the verb. And for transitive verbs, we can have a singular or plural verb stem in a few cases. And again, we could use the plurational and the iterative. And as with the subject, it's possible to use more than one of these um, marking methods. So to, to finish up with, there are a few areas of um, possible further research that um, this leads me to think about. One is um, to get more into the difference between pluractional and iterative morphemes. They often have similar functions, but they don't overlap entirely. So for example, I don't have examples of the iterative morpheme being used for habitual aspect, but I do for the pluractional one. We could also look at uh, lexical aspect and how that interacts with the different number marking devices. And then um, what's of particular interest to me is the idea of hierarchy and conflict. So the language has multiple devices. What's the hierarchy between them when they conflict? So a plural intransitive verb stem with singular inflectional marking, for example, is always understood as having a plural subject. So how many of the other devices can conflict and what's the interpretation when they do? Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Helen, for this very interesting presentation, particularly so much interesting new data to look at. Um, so I think we can now begin the question and answer section. Uh, the question and answer section will be open to voice questions today as well as written questions. So this is a new format that we're trying out today. And we're going to be working with the, uh, with the hand raising option of Zoom. So you should be, uh, or you should have a, a raise your hands option within the Zoom application. Um, and once you do so, I can, I can give you the, the turn and unmute your microphone so you can actually ask a question. Uh, if you prefer to use the written questions, that's also still possible. So just put them in the chat and I will read them out. Uh, please do remember that the webinars are being recorded. So if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording as well. Okay, so I have a question from Richard Griskin. Uh, for my question, I just have a really basic question uh, concerning one of the uh, types of uh, partial constructions that you discussed today. So the suppletive stems, um, I'm just curious, what sort of uh, diachronic story do you have in mind for the development of these suppletive stems? Um, that's a very good question. I personally don't. Um, I'd love to know if someone else does. I um, only know the only languages I've worked on, the only language I've worked on that has them is Sandawi. So I'm not sure. It's interesting with the ones that are um, uh, the intransitive ones, they do seem to be the most basic um, actions, living and dying and coming and going and then um, slightly more um, exotic verbs like limping and uh, crawling um, don't have this. I can see Bonnie saying um, they're quite common in Southern African Khoisan. Yes, I've also seen, uh, just a quick comment, um, at least one verb comes to mind in, uh, in the toga. So uh, the verb to run, there's um, uh, supportive forms for the, the number of the subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Richard. Then I have a question from Martin. He, um, he says, fascinating, is it possible to use a plurectional on a plural sup uh, suppletive stem? Um, there's the, the newa, so the um, to live and then the, the wa. Um, yes, um, but I'm, I've been trying, I saw that question, I've been trying to think if I can think of other examples. Um, my, my impression would be that it, my guess would be that you could because, because of its use for habitual aspect. So apart from the example of the newayo for they lived a long time, 
um, I, I think Neewa would also be possible. Um, and if, if you uh, were running habitually, Tawa, Giriboiwa, yeah, I, I think that's possible. It's certainly possible in the Neewa. Marty then goes on to say your imagined example with the mice indicated uh, by plurectionality wa uh, would be plurectional on a uh, transitive verb, but referring to the subject, is that correct? Yes, that would be. Um, I think that's how it works because um, with the example of working, um, you can put the plurectional on, on work for, again, working habitually. So I, I'm this, this wa that I've given the label plurectional, I'm very uncertain on what it should really be called and I um, certainly in the grammar that I wrote I put uh, I called it multiple because I was sitting on the fence and possibly because I hadn't heard of plurectional as a term at the time um, because it it is often used for the equivalent of habitual aspect um, or for habitual aspect but I guess um, there are other cases where it's used for plural subject like the um, the heavy whiskers, so it's multifunctional. And we'll finish with the last comment from Martin, it's just suppletive collectional have very often indeed die among them. So okay, right. And with that, I see that Andrew has raised his hand, so I'll ask him to unmute. Hi, Helen, thanks for uh, the talk. I think the data is just incredibly nuanced, I think from a, from a phonological perspective, but also um, in terms of the semantics that come out. It's really interesting. Um, I, I guess my question specifically is, is there any sort of story for, for where the iterative ma or the plurational wa morphemes come from? Like, is there any evidence for a verb or an adverb in Sandawe being related to these morphemes? Or is there any evidence that this or like a form like it is found in, in, in wider Khoisan? Um, I think Bonnie should answer that one in the chat box. Um, but apart from that, um, it, they're very interesting, um, me and wa, because uh, they're not very Sandawe-like. <laughs> Um, it's not very Sandawi like, although there are more multisyllabic words generally in Sandawi. A lot of verbs are monosyllabic, um, but there isn't a me or a wa verb. Um, and to me, it's quite interesting as well that the verbs that act um, as, uh, as if they are monomorphemic in some ways, like time for cook. Um, you you realize they're not when you do certain things to them and and they become tiwa for cook them and not timewa um mm -hmm. so they seem quite um quite well established as um suffixes and yeah uh, and but it's not yeah it's not clear to me where they could come from i don't know if um there are other theories on it from other languages but just just the me and wa as syllables, they don't really seem particularly Sandawi like. Thank you. If that's all from Andrew, I'm gonna, uh, Bonnie, I think, wants to jump in. I was just gonna say we have a me morpheme in Hadza, which actually attaches to nouns, but it does have a sort of plural function. So if you say Bonnie me be, be being the feminine plural, this would be Bonnie and her people the may sort ah. of associational morpheme. So it does sort of have a similarity, <laughs> at least in yeah. that. Okay, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the, the Sandawe equivalent is the chi, which I was um, thought of as the akina suffix um, from, from Swahili, but um, that chi is interesting because it's also um, in the benefactive objects, but it's more, um, you find it in plural demonstratives um, and also you can say Helen Chi for Helen and her crew. Um, uh -huh. So it's a similar, yeah, but uh, it's interesting that there's May there. <clears throat> yeah. And I have looked for possible cognates among the suppletive forms in, in Khoisan, but it's, it is hard because we, you know, as uh, in the Gilderman and Elderkin paper looking for Sandawe sound correspondences with Kwe, uh, you just, it, yeah, it's just hard. So just to give an example with the to verb in, in the Dwi dictionary, the 
to die word also means to be broken. So when you've got a lot of polysemy like that, uh, you're not even sure that you're really comparing the same root. Yeah, okay, yeah. So even though there are suppletives there, they, y y you would hope that you could find something like an I, me sort of suppletion that's common over uh, Indo-European, but it, it's not quite so easy. That, but I agree with uh, Martin's comment that the to die verb often has a suppletive. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Bonnie. Then I think I'm going to go on to Martin next. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's getting used to this chat plus plus raising hands. So I want to go back to uh, to the discussion uh, a few minutes ago. Well, maybe then I'll ask, uh, start with the last thing. The Ime is also Ime in Sandawe, and Roland makes the remark that that is very similar to the durative Im in Westrift. Mm -hmm. uh, the durative Im in Westrift is a, is a bit of an odd one out within Westrift, because, within, within Cushitic, because the Im, the M is usually the, the passive in Cushitic. And, in Westriff, it has this durative function. So I'm intrigued by uh, by Helen's remark that the Ime doesn't look Sandawe like. Uh, I was very happy to uh, to see Sandawe as influencing uh, Westriff in this area. Mm. I have to rethink that. Um, I asked about uh, the prorectional on the prorectional because in so in a number of languages where it is possible to to stack prorectionals, the double prorectional marking means. Uh, a bit, a bit of plural, um, um, but but maybe indeed you had your doubts on on the on the terminology because this this prorectional wa is a, is is if I understand it correctly then also different from the suppletive uh, prorectional marking in the sense that suppletive is always. Um, well, uh, a plural subject if only if if the verb is intransitive, whereas this uh -huh. you know, va could refer to the subject even if the verb is is transitive. So, yeah, I mean that's the I've just uh, gone back to that slide. Um, so there's a wa in the um, what work do you do? Um, repeating the work, um, yeah. and then in eight the the plural stem ne for live with with the wa as well um which i feel like i have seen that one not just because of the yo as well on it the durative but i feel like ne wa is um is common but it could just be because it's a common thing to ask about where do you live um where do you stay it's it's a kind of in conversation it would come up um as a habitual maybe Yes, yes. Is it the case that uh, Roland calls the iterative prorectional and uh, your wa uh, plural? Um, I would have to check back, but I think, yeah, we don't have this. Well, we don't have the same terms because I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not sure if he's here to answer that himself, but um, because there's also a, a wa, which is a plural object and I think at least in some examples some things I've read he um, talked about the plural object wa um, together with what I called the plurational wa whereas I've separated them but as you can see from what I uh, mentioned from Ed El Elderkin on that yeah it is possible that yeah it's it's related um, but I've just kept them apart um, to keep it clearer for for my mind at least yeah no rightly so yeah All right, then uh, I think Andrew has another question. Yeah, returning to the uh, the iterative morpheme M and its uh, and and the similar well durative or habitual uh, im morpheme in West Rift. I mean, I I, I find that a really striking um, uh, parallel between the two morphemes. I also noticed in one of your examples. Uh, there was this, uh, there was the iterative morpheme me, and there was a causative morpheme uh, that was marked in 
S in one of your examples. I believe it was the, the mouse making mouse. the hole yeah. in the clothes. I found that really striking as well because uh, as well as this M uh, in Sandawe corresponding with, uh, th so this iterative M corresponding with a durative or uh, habitual M in Cushitic or in West Rift, um, the, the, the West Rift uh, causative is also S. Uh, so if we see, uh, and also when we when we put them together, the the M morpheme uh, in Cushitic, we see this durative uh, or habitual morpheme will always stick closer to the verb root than the causative, and we see the exact mm -hmm. same pattern here okay. in uh, Sandawe. Yeah, I mean it's interesting that that what I so in fifteen Oron Mese um, becomes Horomse so the the me is is just a syllabic m um uh so or a tone bearing m at least horomse so that's um yeah i mean i i believe that's still the me in there but it's not even pronounced like that and I, it's interesting what what you're saying about the im um because the i was just going back to it but the i had the the pronunciation of bike um with the plural form of um Biki mewa, um, not bike mewa. Um, I have wondered about that. <laughs> why why it's not um, bike mewa or bike ma? What is the e before the m there? So um, that's interesting. Thank you. And then I see there's a comment in the chat from Christian who says, for what it's worth, um, in Koi Koi Namadara, uh, Ma means to stand. Okay. And Marta just posted a comment to say that Roland has the E before M as part of the suffix e mm. I Apart from the Niki Mewa, I, I don't have examples where it, it's clearly there. I have some examples where the verb ends in that vowel anyway, so you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, yeah, but that's interesting. It just also made me think about um, the languages I normally work with in Mbeya, where um, to, to stand is is im, is quima, or quima. So I had never thought about that before, but um, yeah, interesting. All right, then um, I have an advertisement from Marte who says that uh, Ongaye and I have an article on plurectionality in Konso in the Journal of African Language and Linguistics. And I have another comment from Bonnie Sands who says, is Stans iterative a common grammaticalization? I, did, I want to know the answer to that as well. <laughs> I'm just thinking again about the example of uh, standing and going around, meaning um, standing around and uh, yeah thinking about standing and iterative it sort of intuitively does work and also doesn't work sometimes <laughs> somehow for me. Uh, Bonnie just replied to that and says I've just checked uh, uh, the BOG and return is a source. Just because it's a uh, hard to type the world lexicon of grammaticalization by Heine and Kateva, but there is a second edition, which I don't have, which is much longer. So I, I think that might be worth looking up and see if there are other examples of where iteratives may have come from. Yeah, and I, I think, um, thinking back, qua, I think, is return in Sandawe, which is now making me think about the wa and making me think about um, uh, reversing some of my labels, but um, yeah. But yeah, that is a, a book that I would recommend to people for mm. thinking about uh, possible sources. Yeah. Thank you. Martin comments that for uh, for him, standing uh, comes from durative. Uh, no, sorry, grammaticalized into durative. Yes, um, if you stand around, that's that's when I, I was saying it's sort of intuitive and not intuitive, um, because standing, staying, that does suggest duration. I think one of the things for Sandawe that, to understand more, it would be helpful to understand more the examples of May, um, and especially Demfolf mentioned this intensiveness, um, which I'm I'm curious to 
to understand more um, what he meant by that and what the examples might suggest in that area. Um, because I think that's the thing with several of these morphemes, because there's so much functional overlap, they're quite often not needed grammatically, so to speak. So you feel like they are must they must be contributing something else. Um, but exactly what is the question? All right, thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentation in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, July 29th by me, myself, and it's titled Varieties and Contacts, uh, Vinco Online Data Collection in Non-Standard Linguistic Varieties. And with that, I would like to thank Helen again for this really interesting presentation and of course everyone else for participating today and hope to see you again at our next webinar.